All right, welcome everybody to GLP's 10 out of 10. Um, this is a series where we ask a variety of lighting designers the same 10 questions. Um, some are thought provoking, some are educational, some are just playing a lot of fun. Um, and at the end, we get to compare notes at some point. So here we are with Justin Kitcherman, lighting designer for two of the largest, uh, most successful country acts out there. Luke Bryan, um, Country Music Entertainer of the Year, and Cole Swindell. Um, welcome, Justin. Thanks for having me, Brian. It's great Good to, to see, see your you, beautiful dude. face again. Yeah, <laughs> again. Oh, you. you zoom um, well. We, we zoom well. <laughs> what would the world do without Zoom? I wish I had bought stock in Zoom. No, I wish I would have heard about it. Sure. Uh -huh. Um, Justin's uh, Nashville based lighting designer and originally hails from the greater Philadelphia area, um, as do I, so that's kind of fun and, and coincidental. But uh, getting right to it, so Justin, what was your first show as a designer? Uh, my first, the first design credit was, uh, was for Hillary Duff, 2004, 2005, for her Metamorphosis, for her, her debut album, Straight Out of Disney. Should have been called Straight Out of Disney without well, <laughs> say that, but yeah, um, uh, yeah, we we uh, I was just kind of working in a shop one day over at Premier Global, and uh, they they were putting together this package for this this girl from you know just had some one-off shows, Disney star, and uh, I got the the gig. I get to go out with it and put a little one-off package together, and um, myself and a tech we loaded it in in, in a couple hours, and I like, sat in front of the house and programmed out a show on an Echelon 1000 uh, console and uh, just made something out of nothing. It's just, it's just one of those trial by fire things. But, um, you know, and then as, as it was just kind of like they were just testing the marketplace and then they put a tour together and uh, Scotty Ross was the brush manager at the time. Mm -hmm. Legendary Scotty Ross. And, uh, he, he and uh, Premier Global kind of suggested that, you know, we just continue to let uh, myself design it. So yeah, working with all those guys, uh, trying to put together a design, and, and you know, it was certainly a, a collaborative effort between uh, you know Creech at Premier Global and myself and, and Scotty, and, and to a certain degree uh, Hillary and her mom. Um, but uh, you know, just kind of put together a package that that would pull well and that was you know, fit the budget. And, um, you know, it was it was what every first design is, and it was just trial by fire and a lot of learning and just figuring out, you know, you know, just making up things. You know, there's processes and, you know, I just trying to piece it all together. Um, you know, just always assuming I was forgetting something, missing something. Um, but, you know, having gotten through it and, you know, with some, some good good leadership from other people, <laughs> um, it, it was a great experience. And it, and it got me, you know, kind of off and running. It really it was the first time, the first real project I kind of started using, like Practiceworks, CAD program, you know, renderings and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So, um, you know, it was... It was a nice, safe, comfortable environment to, to step off into, and uh, I was kind of fortunate to be there at the time for that. So, uh, but yeah, that was that was the first one, uh, 2004, I guess that was. That's awesome. All, all Hillary Duff. That was a fun Sweet. show too, man. Great crew. We had a great, great time. We, uh, traveled the world on that thing. Very, very cool. Yeah. Well jumping off of that from having a great time so what's the most spinal tap embarrassing moment on the show that you're willing to tell us about <laughs> man um yeah so there's one in, in particular uh, and I'll, I'll try not to mention names but it was a, it's a person is still relevant and it was her first tour it was her first first show of her first headlining tour um and we had been in rehearsals here in nashville for about eight weeks but we had never rehearsed the entire show from top to bottom. And the way the show started was there's an Austrian curtain and uh, two side iMag projection screens. And the way that the show was supposed to start was there's a video role that played on the side screen. So it was about two minutes long. A lot of band gets in place and dancing and all that stuff. Um, well, as a lot of starting of bands do, um, there was a lot of people wearing multiple hats. So our, Rigger was our production manager, was our stage manager, was you know, the guy calling the show. Um, and I, I guess just no one ever really told him about this video role that played or he was just unaware of it or he forgot or he panicked, I don't know. Um, 
But anyway, you know, we call house lights, house lights go, the video starts rolling. And in the darkness, you just see the curtain starting to come up and up and up and up. And uh, the band freaked out. So without the PA on, you just heard from the stage. And we're like, oh crap, it's starting. And the dancers come running out from underneath the curtain that they're supposed to do, and they're dancing and getting the crowd into it. The crowd starts to go nuts. And, you know, I'm taking cues and the lights are coming up. I have spots hitting people. And then, you know, the PA comes on. And then the curtain starts closing back down again. <laughs> I just kind of look over the shoulder and see it happen. And man, they beeline underneath, like Indiana Jones, they just beeline underneath the curtain as it's closing. And you know, the curtain hits the ground. I'm backing up cues. And you know, we're back to a black spot that faded out. The PA goes off. The video's still rolling. And uh, you know, we get 30 seconds later to the end of the video clip. And now you heard it. Bad. <laughs> and the curtain comes up. And you know, we're back at the start of the show. But we're just like, man, this is. This is ominous, man. I hope this is, it gets better than this because <laughs> we nailed that. Um, <laughs> but those are the moments, man, I, I, I call the, the climb under your desk and just die, just pretend yeah. you're not there. <clears throat> just wait for that moment to pass you by. And, and they happen all the time. And usually it's technical things. You know, network will drop out or <clears throat> someone unplugs something or whatever, power issues. Um, that, was, <clears throat> that was totally avoidable and, and boy, cringeworthy to say the least. So, but we got through it, and then the tour was successful, and everybody lived quite another day. Uh, yeah, but, I, I'm <laughs> sure it didn't happen twice. So, no, <laughs> not, not the same way for sure. Excuse me. <coughs> um, but yeah, that's good. Not not something you want to have happen, but that's good. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um. All right. So number three. So, what's the best advice anybody ever gave you, professionally or otherwise? <laughs> Um, yeah, it, you touched on it earlier. <coughs> Excuse me, but I got a little something in my throat. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, I, I, I came up through, uh, as a stagehand at the Taj Mahal, it was my first real gig in this, in this business, professional gig. Um, and a lot of great mentors, and a lot of them you and I are, you know, know from, from different circles, but, um, you know, just a bunch of either old road guys or just, you know, people who've been doing it for a very long time. And, uh, me being the young guy on the crew, it was just that that dynamic where just everybody takes you under the wing. And everybody has a place for you. Everybody has a little nugget. You know, everybody shows you the proper way to do something or their own way to do something. And you know, all the little things you take with you the whole your whole career. Um, and there's not really any specific thing that I I can remember that anybody told me that was just like yes. Um, but it was the reinforcement of things like professionalism and being on time. And, you know how important it is. You know. Yes, this is a fun occupation, and yes, there's a lot of liberties in this. Um, but nobody wants you to show up 15 minutes late to a gig. Nobody wants to show you up a minute late to a gig. Um, you know, nobody wants you to show up with alcohol in your back, or, you know, unable to perform the job. Um, you know, those those type things were were what were really instilled in me, and I had that anyway. But you know. It, when 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 people are telling you that in a professional setting, you're kind of in that new, you know, position, trying to figure find your way through and, and navigate, you know, the road ahead. Uh, those are the things that that stick in your mind, right? Those, those are the things when you're when you're given the choice of, hey, let's go out for some drinks before loadout. Um, you're like, yeah, I got loadout. I can't. Not it's cool. You don't understand. Um, and sometimes I still scratch my head. You know, you, you run into these, these problems through, through the course of working where um, people didn't know that. And I, I, I find it strange that it's like, wow, I mean, why would you show up today? Or, you know. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. You know, just the, the whole be on time, be, be, you know, be straight, be, you know, be able to work, you know, work hard. Don't. Don't bitch about the job. The, the job sucks a lot. We all know it does. You know, we don't need to hear about it. Just do it. And, you know, laugh about it later. Cry about it now. Laugh about it later. Um, you know, we all wear those badges. We all have those scars. It's the worst yeah. gig ever. And uh, you know, it's 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 the it's what we signed up for. You know, they don't pay you to do easy jobs. That's right. <laughs> it's why they call it work. Well, they call it work. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
All right. Well, then, professionally, what's your proudest achievement? Um, man, I, you know, there's a lot of things, but uh, off the top of my head, um, being a part of shows, going back home, um, certainly going and playing. I mean, I've played pretty much everywhere in Philly now, uh, and, and certainly I saw shows in all these places, but um, some of them weren't even, it didn't even exist, but <clears throat> you never play it. Lincoln Financial Field, uh, where the Eagles play, and Citizens Bank Park, where Phillies play, and, and uh, the, the Wells Fargo Center. You know, um, back in the day, the Spectrum, you know, being able to go play there. I mean, I saw, man, dozens of concerts at the Spectrum growing up. Um, and uh, not to mention the Flyers, the history of the sports teams there, and, um, you know, the, the theaters in Philly. It just, to me, to go back there, it's special. Plus, when you go back there, you, it's, you always have friends and family always kind of make their way out and you kind of get to demonstrate to people, you know, this is what I do when I go away for eight months out of the year and you don't see me or, you know, this is the, this is the silliness that you, you, know, <laughs> you can't imagine I'm a part of every day. Um, you know, even going down to like Atlantic City and, and Boardwalk Hall and uh, some of the casinos down there at Borgata uh, and working with the, some of the people that, that I, I came up with. That, that taught me, that gave me the, that advice, and took me to the wing, and showed me the ropes. And, um, to me, that's really special, and uh, I just, yeah, I do feel proud from those moments, and, and not of like my own achievements, but just kind of like, you know, hey, I did it. You know, you guys, you believed in me way back then. You, you know, and here I am, kind of doing something with it, and um, yeah. You know, so, so that there's a lot of pride in that, but I mean, I, I take pride in everything I do. You know, it's the first shows are always at the end of them. With the exception of a few, <laughs> um, you know, by by the end of a tour, you're just so over it, and you're thinking of the next thing, and and you know, it, it all looks the same, and it all it just blends, and you know, you've seen it all, but the first shows, and you're seeing that brand new production out of the box, man, it's just, it, it's it, it makes me well up a little bit sometimes, um, but uh, you know, I don't know, I, I'm not really a proud person, so. Uh, it takes a lot to really stoke that emotion in me sometimes. But, um, I guess I guess that would be going home. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Standing in the Eagles locker room. It's fun. <laughs> That's cool. For a, kid, for a kid like me, who would never get there on my athletic ability. <laughs> <laughs> but you got there, and that's important. But I got there with some sort of ability. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, so with all the work you do and the travel and everything, what do you do in your downtime? Uh, I'm a homebody, man. I uh, I come home and it's it's family and and you know activities and just daily life. And, um, we uh, we travel uh, as much as we can. We have family. I have family up in Delaware and, and Maryland area and Pennsylvania. Um, my wife's family's down in Louisiana, <laughs> so we. Um, we're kind of 10 hours either way to, to get the family, uh, but we homeschool. Uh, so we, we, we kind of made that decision so we could have the, the, the freedom to travel, um, in the winter time, especially, you know, with, um, we, uh, we try and take some trips and vacation. Um, you know, one of the benefits of homeschool is homeschool happens anywhere. So if we do go to Mexico, we can find, you know, some reason to turn it into a homeschool event, right? Counts for the kids. And, um, same thing on some of our trips, stop at national parks or whatever, and, and that, that counts towards home school. It's, um, it's a cool thing. So, um, but yeah, home projects, uh, you know, I, I geek out, I, I play, I play video games. Um, I'm that guy. I love, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, mindless activities. I, you know, I, I love to shut it down, man. I just love to relax, mm -hmm. not think about work, not think about, the grind um you know there's this so much go 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 when i'm when we're doing it that when we're not doing it uh, i just like to you know not be turned on i just like to be, go from 60 to zero yeah it's like yeah. be present and enjoy things and, and give people my love um, so and, and it keeps us busy and time flies i mean even this this whole lockdown thing uh the time has seemed to fly by i mean Mm -hmm. so it, it seems, you know, I'm ready to get back to work, but um, 
it, it hasn't been, it hasn't felt like I've been drawing out time. Or <laughs> I, I still think it's April. <laughs> um, it, it is. It is still April. Uh, yeah, it's April. <laughs> uh, April, April 70th. Yes. There you go. <laughs> awesome. So we were speaking about venues before. What what's the best venue you've worked in? Um, man, there's there's some really good ones. You know, I I like the ones that have history. I, I'm a I, I always feel like sometimes you can go places and feel just feel like mm -hmm. history happened here. Um, certainly battlefields are a major event places, right? Like there's just some about it. But same thing in buildings, man. Like like you go to Madison Square Garden. Um, which is not necessarily the most fun place to put a show into or get it out of, um, but to actually do a show there and be in that, that venue and, mm -hmm. and walk those halls, um, you know, look at the pictures of the wall and just just know, that, you know all the people play there, all the events that happen there, the moments, the, the iconic moments that happen there, um, the forums and other places kind of like that, um, you know, and it, there's a lot of great brand new facilities for sure. That you just love going to, and it's a it's a it's a easy day. And, and um, but for me, it's kind of that you know those those iconic places, you know, the Hollywood Bowl. We did a, a show there, and you know, I just took my my phone up to the top of the stands, listen to the Doors live at the Hollywood Bowl, and just you know imagine those three dudes, four dudes running around down there, right. um, you know, with with no production whatsoever, <laughs> you, know, you know, this iconic moment. So, um, Woodstock, um, there's that, that venue out in Woodstock, um, right on the other side of the hill from, from where that all happened. Um, you know, the, the, the venue is, is not the great, you know, it's not the best venue in the world, but again, you're there, you're there with this history happening through, you're just, you know, you walk up the top of the hill and look down and you can picture it. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's unique, man. It's, it's, it's to be able to go to some of these places that you, you've read about and seen footage of and watched you know live recordings and listen to them it's it's pretty cool you know, to be in that space and, um me personally like, i can kind of i can feel it you know, i can sense that the energy still remains it's, it's cool mm -hmm. kind of spiritual thing i guess i don't, I don't really know cool uh, then there's a then there's a little places you and i talked about that place in new hampshire at one time too oh gilford yeah yeah, where it's yeah, it's like you don't care. I mean, you put about a third of your show in it, um, you know, painting the S factor off the roof. But you know, you get done the show and there's lobster and lobster and oyster bar in the back set up for you, shrimp shrimp cocktail. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, they make up for it with that. And then there's lakes, and, you know, the, the, the lake right there with Lake Winnipesaukee, is it? I think yeah. it is right. Uh -huh. And uh. Know, bikes and it's just it's just super cool you're like you know suddenly you're in like uh i don't know what was the what was the john candy movie where he went camping or had the cabin with dan Aykroyd that <coughs> so um but yeah you know man it's um yeah, and a great crew can make it for sure for sure for sure um yeah, but it, there's a uh, there's a lot of really good venues out there these days. Um, yeah, technology is catching up with the venues. We're in some of those hundred year old places that you don't dare speak of. Or dwindling, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> time marches on. Time marches um, on. In this in this whole interesting time where the world kind of stops spinning for a while. What's the one album or artist that you couldn't do without during the quarantine? Hmm. I, uh, I have listened a lot to uh, The Wall live, I think The Wall live at Earl's Court, which um, I, I think, I, I'm pretty sure I, I know, but um, maybe I'm wrong, was, was the, one of the last shows, if not the last show, of the original lineup uh, before Roger Waters left the band. Um, and it's, you know, it's on, it's just an audio. I don't have the, the video of it. So, but as the production geek that I am, being able to kind of just picture in my mind what's happening and, and dissecting all the, the things that you're hearing and, and knowing, you know, the, the production, how it was built and storyline. Um, 
you know, in 1980, you know, it's been designed in the 70s, you know, put together in the 70s with, you know, technology that they're just inventing to make it happen. You know, how cool. Um, you know, and then to, to know that it was, like, done without without MIDI, and it was done without mm -hmm. time code and, and Ableton, and, and, you know, there, there was guys playing back reels, I'm assuming, of uh, playback, you know, on in time, um, multiple bands playing, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, just the whole thing, you know, and, and the vision to put it together, you know, the vision of, of one of the, the creativity of the album and the story and, and you know, the, the personal feel of it too. Um, you know, the artistry of it all, but then to, to kind of visualize the production that's going along with it um, 40 years ago, <laughs> right? Um, yep. Insane, you know, and, and you know, we, we walk around with media servers and stock content my chest is out like we're doing something special um you know it's just it's it's insane you know these, these people who you know invented the industry that that we are are working in. um and that's that's something i take away from that that album aside from just you know it's just being a great listen um but yeah that's something i've kind of listened to a lot plus it's long yeah so i, mm -hmm. can, I can kind of put it on and just kind of move about my day and it's on the background um you know every song is a great song cool yeah, absolutely. One of my all-time favorite bands. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you could go back in time, what what advice would you give the teenage version of yourself? <laughs> Buy Google. <laughs> Buy Apple stock, right? Buy um, Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> um, man, I, you know, I was fairly unmotivated. Certainly, as a teenager, I, I I just I had that mentality of like ah, I'll do it later, or don't need to know that, or you know I can do it good enough. Uh, I never really dove in anything. I never really applied myself all the way. Um, I'd get good enough at something just to, to know I could do it, and then I die next thing. You know, I, I wanted to do it all. I didn't want to do anything really well. Um, and I, I think about that a lot, like especially you know I see some of these musicians. That I, I work with, it's like man, if, if I would have, you know, I, I played in band for years, I played guitar for years, but I just never mastered it. I just I played it, I could make noise, and as part of the band, I could be a, a part of the sound. But you know, I, I can't play. I can't. I'm, I'm definitely not a master. But um, if I would have just studied it, if I would have actually taken some lessons from people who knew how to teach it, and, um, you know, where could I have been? You know, could I? Have, made a go of it, especially down, you know, coming to East Town and seeing you know, some of the people who are actually doing it. Um, but, you know, what wasn't my path and, and whatever. I, I, I kind of feel like when I got into lighting particularly, uh, I had sort of changed that aspect of my, my way of thinking mm -hmm. and really did dive into it and learned it. was able to, I'd sort of not master it, but, um, you know, be productive at it. <laughs> you know, I keep trying. It just keeps more changing. Of, if it would stop more changing, of a singular it would be faster. Focus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, cool. But yeah, it's, that's probably one. And then, you know, I slept a lot. Man, I was world champion sleeper. I could sleep 18 hours a day when I was a teenager. Just wouldn't get out of bed for anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's a gift. There you go. A gift of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next question. I'm going to preface this first because I know how much you like coffee and I've seen yeah. your front of house road case and it's yeah. the only front of house road case with a building <laughs> coffee maker that I've ever seen. Well, I mean, so, that's not fair. So if you could sit down for coffee with one person living or dead, who would it be? Yeah, I'm going to say Neil Armstrong. Um, he, uh, watching a lot of, a lot of shows last year with the, with the moon landing about, and about him and about just about the whole program. Uh, but he really struck me as somebody just, just super. I mean, obviously interesting, but how cerebral he was, and how just calm and dialed in in the absolute most chaotic moments, you know, life-threatening moments, historical moments. Um, and he was just about the task at hand, and and you know, the process of making it happen, and um, you know, and then uh, along with just the personal life that he he led. 
um, the, the story of how a, a kid grows up on a farm in Ohio, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, someday, you know, lands on the moon. <laughs> right? Like, I mean, how would you not want to just sit there and just listen to whatever story that man had to offer? Um, you know, some of the, you know, the thing that really struck me is, especially in the moon landing and descent, you know, and he, he took over, he, he flew that thing manually. It was, it was flying him into a crater and he just, you know, low on fuel, started flying this untested rocket, you know, spaceship across the surface of the moon, looking for a place to set it down and set it down. Um, and then was just like, you know, yeah, we're here. <laughs> Calm as can be. <laughs> right? Keep drink, we're already base. <laughs> All right? Um, you know, that's pretty cool. You know, everybody likes listening to the old timers. Everybody likes, you know, nothing better than a guy that has a good story. Um, you know, uh, it, I think that would be pretty cool. Um, and, you know, there's, there's many more for sure. But uh, so off the top of my head, I, I think that's a new one. Cool. Yeah. My daughter and my wife met Buzz Aldrin at a book signing. I was super jealous about that. Oh, awesome. And uh, my daughter is probably, she's young, she's probably three or four. And I, I was like, you know, you met a man who walked on the moon. <laughs> like that, you don't meet many of them. There's not no. that many of them out there. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So, final question. Um, so, your country's oh. called you up for the Olympics, summer yeah. or winter. What sport will you be competing in? <laughs> uh, and you can't pick sleeping. Yeah. No. Uh, I would excel. I, I gold medal in sarcasm and wit, but uh, <laughs> apparently that's not recognized. Um, yeah, if I had to say, uh, my two favorite things that I, I would like to be professional athlete wise, and I don't even know if they're Olympic sports, they probably are. Everything's an Olympic sport these days, uh, would be professional golfer or professional surfer. Uh, and I do neither one of those things well at all, even close to well. Um, and, uh, but you know, you, you pretty much to train for those things, you just fly to exotic locations and either play golf or surf. Um, essentially, I know there's a lot more work in it than that, but right, like you're it, dumbed down to the, you know, it's like, why would you want to run a marathon? Like, why, why yeah. would you want to do that as a sport to train for that? You know, that's something that, you, you know, maybe once in your life, you like just to say you did it. I can, I can understand that, but. Um, you know, I'd be no good at shot put or probably any of the track and field or uh, but hanging on a beach in Fiji, you'd be good. Bobsled, I think bobsled would be fun, right? That'd be a good mm -hmm. one. Just sledding, um, ski jump, I think, uh, if you could figure it out, if you, could, if you knew you could land it, would be awesome. But man, if you weren't quite sure if you could land that thing, I, I think it would, you know, it's climbing up those steps would suck. <laughs> <laughs> And then you're on the wide world of sports reel forever. Yeah, and it's so cold, and you're like wearing this leotard. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, man, you, you got to be able to do that. I don't even know how you train for that stuff. But that's the thing I always think is like, well, how do you like, how do you train for that? Like, how's the first time you do that? Like, what do you, you know, maybe that's what separates the, the people who make it from the people who don't. You know, the right. people who try it the one time and land on their back instead, they, they you never hear from them again. I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, no, we're we're all safe for me ever being a participant athletically in the Olympics. I wouldn't mind working in the Olympics, that'd be kind of cool. It'd be kind of cool to see that and be a part of it. But, um, uh, I, I did work at the, the Pan Am Games back in 1999 up in Winnipeg. That was that was a hell gig. But <laughs> so maybe be careful what you wish for. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't even know if I answered your question. <laughs> I think you want to surf in Fiji. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. We're golfing Florida. Roman Greco um, wrestling. How about there, that? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Brian. Good um, seeing you, man. I appreciate it, man. It's nice great you. to see you, dude.